putting a scene in front of you. The monitors are pulsating at a regular beat. We are doing a surgery to remove a tumor from the stomach through keyhole incisions with the help of laparoscopes. Okay. Everything is going on very smoothly, absolutely fine. Suddenly, the monitor above me starts blaring red and the alarms ring. I look up and I see the heart rate is at 150. The blood pressure, not recordable. I'm filled with adrenaline. What follows is a series of events, which is a culmination of years of training, bringing the heart rate down, coaxing the blood pressure up, returning the patient through what we call sinus rhythm with the help of a plethora of drugs. A quick conversation between the surgeon and me leads us to conclude that a tiny rent has formed in the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle between the thorax, that's your chest, and the abdomen. This rent has allowed a little bit of air to escape between the chest wall cavity and the lung, causing what we call a pneumothorax. The quick thinking surgeon immediately runs across to the other side. He takes a needle and sticks it in and a comforting hiss of sound confirms our diagnosis. The patient has returned to sinus rhythm, hemodynamically normal. I look down at my watch to clock in the time on my anesthesia chart. It's been seven minutes since that first arrhythmia. Seven precious minutes, which were more stressful than the entire seven hour surgery. I'm going to take you, my audience now, and put you all into a time capsule and hurl you all off to another place, another time. The year is 1847. The place is a small village in France where a Western classical composer, Frédéric Chopin, has written the most delightful little waltz for the piano called the Minute Waltz. He calls it the Minute Waltz because it's a minute waltz. It's supposed to be played in just a minute, but in actual facts, takes about a minute and a half to two minutes to play. But that small span of time is filled with beautiful sound, fun, frolic of sound, pianistic gymnastics, as I call it. Your fingers have to move at such a fast, alluring pace and the pianist also has the added responsibility of creating a tapestry in the listener's mind. Frédéric Chopin wants you to conjure the image of a little dog chasing his own tail. So going round and round and round in circles. It's a minute and a half of absolute stress, pleasure and pain. Hi everyone, I'm Bhanwanti Rajwade. I'm an anesthesiologist as well as a Western classical pianist and I run a Western Classical Music Appreciation Club in Mumbai. Through my anesthesia passions, I meet a wide diaspora of people. I meet people who come very sick, waiting for tumors to be removed. I meet people who are healthy and coming to deliver babies. I'm privileged to be a part of two very different aspects of their lives, but an important part nonetheless. Through my musical passions, I meet people who are either dipping their toes in Western Classical Music or who are neck deep in it. These are people who are very passionate about the humanities. They're pursuing interests in music, art, literature, passion, and through them and with them, we all undergo a journey through history. We study composers, we understand why they composed the way they did, why they created music that they did in the times that they did. One common link connecting both these very different sets of people is they always ask me one common question. How do you find the time to do something like anesthesia as well as music? Where do you find the time? And I find myself always looking at them quizzically because a day is 24 hours, right? 24 hours is 1,440 minutes, right? Surely that's enough time to be able to do what you want to do. Throughout my day, I meet doctors, nurses, technicians, patients who are juggling so many responsibilities. These are women ordering vegetables, gas cylinders, uh, coordinating work from home calls, Zoom calls for school and homeschooling. It's amazing to see how they juggle it all. It leaves me spellbound. But when these women say, we don't have time to pursue a hobby or we don't have time for ourselves, I look at them in shock. 24 precious hours, 1,440 minutes. To give you perspective, let's look into nature. 
there's a very tiny insect called the mayfly. The mayfly is born in water as a nymph. It grows, it sexually matures, it congregates with other mayflies and they dance in circles. They reproduce and they die. All within the span of a single day. 24 hours is the life cycle of a mayfly. This insect was popularized by a famous English poet called George Crabbe. He has compared the mayfly to the newspaper. So just imagine the newspaper arrives at your doorstep in the morning, hot off the press. It conjures up a lot of excitement, may ruffle a lot of feathers, may provide tremendous entertainment. And at the end of the 24 hours, when you put it aside, it is, well, just yesterday's news. Look around you. In a single day, one tree can produce enough oxygen for two living beings on this planet. In a single day, your hair can grow 0.35 millimeters. In a single day, your heart beats 1,4,000 beats on an average. I always tell people, if you want to understand the value of time, ask an anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologists are the timekeepers of medicine. Anesthesiologists are the timekeepers of surgery. We know that after 90 seconds of giving a drug called succinylcholine, you can pass a tube into the windpipe. We know that after 60 minutes of a urologist resecting a prostate, you must tell him that the time is ticking. We know that after 90 minutes of tying a tourniquet, the orthopedic surgeon must be alerted to the value of that. We know that it takes one golden hour in which you should restart a heart. So what do you think 24 hours are to us? 24 hearts restarted or at least attempted? Modern times have placed a great emphasis on rest and relaxation. We have been taught by social media to assume that boredom begets creative genius. The more bored you are, the more relaxed you are, the more your creative juices will spew and you'll end up producing absolutely marvelous inventions. I always warn you, look back two generations. I'm taking my grandmother, for example. When she watched us when we were little kids, she would never just sit idle looking at us. She would be knitting, producing one sweater after the other. She had a set of beads. She would be making one bead bag or a piece of jewelry after the other. And well, if she ran out of all material, like shelling peas or cleaning the vegetables. How many of y'all had grandmothers like that? I'm sure a lot of us have. That generation was taught that every second mattered. Every minute was precious. Life is short. We cannot let it go away. A lot of people I meet have labeled people like me. They call us restless. They call us type A. I have only one thing to say to that. None of the things I do has an outcome of winning or losing. How would you quantify patient-related satisfaction with anesthesia or joy experienced while listening to Western classical music? They are unquantifiable things. There is no question of winning or losing. It is just a desire to use every minute of your day to make it productive, make it count. A lot of us have plans like after 10 years, I will take up uh, marathon running or I will learn karate or I might uh, start going to an ODC dance class. Who knows when those 10 years will come? My message to you today is short and simple. Be that mayfly. Live today like it's your last. Challenge yourself. Push your boundaries. Whatever box you've made around yourself saying you don't have time, you do have time. Step out of that box, leap out of it, break that glass ceiling. 24 hours, 1,440 minutes. Make it count. Thank you.